Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey. <laughs> so, uh, it's nice to be here. It's been, what, three years since uh, we were both together in this place, so it's good to be back in this place. So uh, today I want to talk about eBPF in a talk called uh, eBPF Superpowers. And this, this is the agenda for this talk. So eBPF, I'm going to talk about principles. Then I'll talk about uh, different ways to apply eBPF and how it makes it different, innovative, or uh, adds functionalities that don't exist uh, at the core in the Linux kernel in the terms of observability, networking, Security, we'll talk about the future, where eBPF is going and where that could take us in terms of the Linux kernel and OS. And I'll talk about, about the practical labs that you can do on different uh, products based on eBPF. <coughs> so first let's talk about the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel, well, pretty much all of us here working with the Linux kernel know there's some exceptions of people that try to automate Windows, you know, and use some products to automate Windows, but most of us will agree uh, our job is based essentially on the fact that Linux has become the prominent OS uh, on the web and in many places. So it's now the main OS from cars to uh, servers to fridges. Uh, it's the foundation of the Linux operating system, obviously, that we love and use everywhere. Uh, it's the most widely used operating system in the world at the moment. And uh, it actually pow powers the vast majority now of m systems of cloud servers, of uh, supercomputers, so it's pretty much everywhere. But the Linux kernel still keeps evolving, and there's new features that are necessary, and especially when we start talking about like cloud native infrastructure, uh, containers, container automation, Kubernetes, for example, there's features that could get uh, improved, new versions, new uh, technology in terms of SDN, in terms of security, and implementing these new features at the kernel level has a cost. And so a few years ago, some people got together to think, how do we make kernel development more agile? How do we make it so that we can keep adding these features for SDN, for security, and so on, without having a huge, uh, very long and complex life cycle? So before eBPF, as you can tell, the problem is, OK, I want this new feature to observe my app, for example, or to add new uh, networking uh, capabilities to Linux. And well. I can make a patch to the Linux kernel, uh, send it. I haven't done it myself, I'm not a Linux developer, but it takes a very long time to get accepted. And even once it gets accepted, it will take a very long time until it actually ends up in a distribution where you can use it uh, in a stable way, right? So probably three years, five years at best until you can actually find your patch in a Linux distribution. And the world, especially the world of cloud native uh, environments is not evolving at this pace. It's actually going much faster, so we want these features to get into the kernel much faster than that. So with eBPF, what's possible is actually extending the Linux kernel in a much faster way. You can actually inject features in the Linux kernel without recompiling, without even rebooting your machine. You can extend the functionalities of the Linux kernel at runtime. You'll say, well, okay, this is not too far from what I could do with a kernel module, for example. But as you'll see, there's a lot of advantages of using eBPF versus kernel modules in terms of security, in terms of stability. So who has used eBPF before? Oh, a few hands. Well, chances are you've actually probably used it without knowing it, right? <laughs> eBPF is used in a lot of places. Um, for example, Facebook uses it for load balancing. Uh, a lot of other uh, cloud providers actually use it for load balancing using XDP with eBPF. Um, it's used for DDoS protection on a lot of cloud platforms as well. Again, using XDP to uh, remove packets that are not wanted and prevent them from actually getting too deep in the kernel. Um, it's actually used for kernel live patching as well. And if you use Android, you've actually probably used eBPF if you've, if you've looked at how your applications are using the bandwidth because this is the way it's done. It actually uses eBPF in the Linux kernel that's provided in Android to tell you which applications are using your bandwidth. So a bit of presentation. This is, this is me. Uh, people that uh, have been coming for a few years uh, to config management may have known me for presenting on Puppet and Terraform in the past. I'm not doing this anymore. 
So now I'm working for isovalent on Cilium, and today I'm going to be talking about eBPF and telling you about how it works, not in details, uh, and what, uh, what are some uh, usages of eBPF. So first, what is it? What is eBPF? One way to look at it is that eBPF makes the kernel programmable at runtime, and it's similar to what JavaScript is to the browser. If you remember, using a web browser without JavaScript, you had pretty much static pages and nothing could be done with them except changing pages. With the addition of, of JavaScript, we can have applications such as Gmail, Google Maps, and other applications not made by Google, right? Because all my examples are from Google. Um, but essentially, it makes the, uh, uh, JavaScript makes the browser programmable, and you can add new functionalities that were not planned in web pages or generally. So in the same way, you can consider that lin the Linux kernel is essentially an event-driven program. It doesn't do much, if not anything at all, on its own. It just reacts to events from the outside, events from uh, the hardware or events from user space. And it makes the link between user space and hardware, essentially. And so because it's based on events, it makes a lot of sense to have a system that is based on events and will allow you to add callbacks to these events. And this is what eBPF is. So eBPF allows you to add programs to different events in the kernel. This is an example using the execv syscall, where whenever this, the execv syscall is called, so to uh, start a new process, it will be called by eBPF, by the eBPF subsystem, and you can add a program that will be triggered. And this program uh, can do a lot of different things. In this case, it will capture the comment that has been executed with its arguments and store it and a data structure that is called an eBPF map, so that it can be used, for example, for observability. So you get really low level, really low latency observability directly plugged to kernel events. So this is the principle. eBPF was founded about 10 years ago, uh, and the uh, eBPF Foundation manages the technology in the Linux kernel. It was co-founded by Facebook, Google, Isovalin, Microsoft, and Netflix. There's more people that have been added since then. These are just the founding members that manage maintaining the technology in the Linux kernel. Technology is still evolving, right? Because there's still uh, additional features that are added to eBPF to make more events available or more helpers, I'll talk about this, available to program eBPF uh, functionalities. So how does it work? Let's see how it works. Let's say I have uh, a process. It could be uh, the Cilium agent, it could be something else. This process will generate an eBPF program in uh, bytecode. So usually, am I using the mic properly? Yep. <laughs> usually, uh, these programs are written in a subset of C and then compiled into eBPF bytecode. And this eBPF bytecode program can then be injected into the Linux kernel using the BPF syscall. The first thing that happens when you do this is that the kernel will actually verify the program you've injected. And that's, that's a very important step. We we'll like to verify it for complexity and for security reasons. So you cannot do as much using an eBPF program as you would be able to do using a kernel module, for example. There's a lot of security constraints and a lot of, of complexity constraints as well. So you're very unlikely to crash your system with an eBPF program or to add security problems, security issues. For example, memory management is very, very restricted in eBPF programs. So the kernel will first verify the program you're injecting. Once the program has been verified and approved, and I've heard eBPF developers, I'm not one myself, say that uh, one of the hardest part of their job is actually to convince the kernel that they do not mean to harm it. That tells you how the, 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 um, the verifier is hindering the possibilities of actually harming the system. So once the program has been approved, it can get compiled using a JIT compiler. It can be compiled to uh, native code, to machine code on your system, so it becomes essentially just as performant as the kernel itself. And it becomes part of the kernel, and you can actually call it by attaching it to different events in the kernel. It can be a syscall, it can be events that are linked to networking interfaces, to drivers, to lots of different things. So when these events happen, your program will be triggered, and you can decide what to do with these events. So then, the 
things happen, right? There's a program, the process in user space that actually starts using the syscalls. Here we've attached our program to the send message and receive message syscalls. So the eBPF program will be called and can react to it. It can be to observe. It can be to actually do something with the kernel. It can be to, in the case of networking, bypass some stacks in the kernel like IP tables. In the case of security, it can be to block processes and so on and so forth. Like I said, a lot of things cannot be done at very low level in eBPF. You cannot do memory management manually. There's a lot of uh, subsystems in the kernel that you cannot call directly from eBPF. So eBPF provides helpers, actually, uh, to secure uh, all this stack, to make it so that you can actually achieve these things, but in a very sandboxed way. So for example, here you have a function called bpf get p random u32, which returns a random number, a uh, random string, uh, no, it's a U32, so it's a number. Uh, and, uh, and this is a helper function, so you don't need to implement it yourself. It's been implemented already in the kernel, and you can use this functionality directly in your programs. You can attach programs to lots of different uh, hooks. Here are some examples. Here to the left, you could attach it to the syscalls, write and read, for example, in the case of files. Uh, you could attach it to a file descriptor, to a virtual file system, to the block device. There's been some great work that has been presented at eBPF Summit last year uh, on people working on imp uh, improving database performance by plugging eBPF directly under the driver. Uh, for example, they have this kind of database that keeps uh, doing uh, read um, loops, uh, seeking loops looking for information and going back and looking further for the information in the, uh, on disk. But the logic in which this loop is, is done depends on the data structure that is used to store the data on disk. And so this researcher has been using eBPF to uh, plug under the driver and actually do the seek loops uh, at the driver level so that it, it doesn't cross the kernel stack every time uh, the seek needs to be achieved. This is one example. Uh, in the case of Cilium, we typically use uh, the network stack. So uh, plug in either to send message and receive message, but we can also plug at the socket level, we can plug at the TCP IP level, and so on. You can actually even plug directly at the, net, at the, the network card device. Uh, this is what XDP allows to do, for example, to directly drop traffic using the network interface physically, so it doesn't even reach the kernel or even implementing load balancing using XDP so that it doesn't even use the internal kernel uh, stack for this. I'm a bit too close for this. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I can inject programs in the kernel, that's fine. But I need to retrieve information or to configure these programs from the outside, from user space, because not everything, not the whole logic is in the kernel. So how does this work? It works using structures that we call eBPF maps. And eBPF maps are accessible, they are part of the kernel, and they're accessible from within the eBPF programs and from user space as well. So they can be used either to program the way, to configure the way the programs run in the kernel, or they can be used to extradite data from the kernel stack to user space. So for example, in the case of observability, a program, an eBPF program that observes everything that is executed in the kernel will be able to write data to eBPF maps that then can be read by user space programs to turn it into Prometheus metrics, some flows, you know, whatever you want, JSON, uh, and so on. But you can also configure the way the programs work in the kernel by putting data from user space into eBPF maps. This is typically what Cilium does to configure the way network policies are applied, for example. So obviously, I've shown, you know, you can make your C program, compile it to bytecode, uh, attach it in the kernel. Very often there's SDKs that are used for this actually. So in development usually there will be a program that will be generated, um, it will be compiled to bytecode, and then you can use an SDK, typically in Cilium we use the Go SDK. Uh, this is the, the logo of the Go <laughs> uh, eBPF SDK. And this SDK will actually take the bytecode program take the, the maps it's supposed to be attached to, the events it's supposed to be attached to, and do the whole plumbing in the kernel, uh, the whole system with the verifying, the JIT compiling, and so on, and attach it to the events for you. So eBPF is secure, is inherently more secure than writing kernel modules, because there is this uh, step of verification 
that makes sure that the program won't harm your system and won't crash your system. It's also, wrong button, it's also performant because once the program has been verified, it can be compiled to machine code, which means you get the same type of performance as the kernel itself. It just runs in, uh, in a virtual machine in the kernel. One benefit for us, especially when it comes to cloud native, is that eBPF programs can understand cloud native identities. When you think about networking, for example, the way networking is implemented in Kubernetes traditionally is by using IP tables. You just inject IP table rules, which essentially say, when you're coming from this IP, going from this ISP, this is how you do it. But IP, um, IP addresses are typically a very transient information that changes all the time in Kubernetes clusters. It's not something very reliable, and it's not something very useful when it comes to observability. So what we can do with eBPF is that we can have programs that actually are aware of the metadata we care about, are aware of the labels on Docker containers or Kubernetes pods, and can use these labels for traffic management or for network policy enforcement. They actually understand what's happening in terms of containers and in terms of uh, Kubernetes logic. In terms of observability as well, they can actually understand that a process is linked to a namespace, is linked to some C groups, is linked to a Kubernetes namespace, and so on, and can report this natively directly from the kernel. So you don't need to do that, um, that connection in user space anymore. So there's lots of projects that have started using eBPF, more and more of them. Cilium is one of them. Uh, BPF Trace, KHRN is a project from Facebook uh, used as a load balancer. Uh, Falco for security, BCC, uh, most of them depend on existing SDKs and will essentially generate programs, inject them into the kernel. What's really interesting is that once again, these programs, once they're in the kernel, they're independent, right? So what Cilium does, for example, when it injects programs to manage routing or network policy is very similar to what another CNI plugin would do when injecting IP tables. Once the rules are injected in the kernel, even if Cilium crashes, it keeps working, just the way that IP tables keeps working, right? It's just kernel code that is being executed. So I'll take a few examples from Cilium's friends, because that's the, the, the tools I know the best, and show you some of the features that, can, that we can benefit from uh, uh, using eBPF. So Cilium, for example, which can be used for performance gains, for example, compared to IP tables, which doesn't scale really well once you have a few hundred nodes in a Kubernetes cluster, uh, or bypassing TCP IP to re-implement it in the case of specific IPv6 functionalities, for example. You can have a simpler architecture. Talk a bit about uh, sidecars in the case of service mesh. Uh, Hubble is the tool that we use for uh, observability and gives very fine-grained network observability based on the data that we get from eBPF and the eBPF routing and observability layers. It can also export to various CMs. It can be uh, Grafana, it can be Elasticsearch, Splunk, and so on. I'll show you a few examples of the observability we can get, as well as tracing. And Tetragon, which is the runtime security, so node observability and security enforcement, uh, based on plugin to kernel events. And it can actually be used to kill processes before they do harm. So let's start with observability. Observability is a very natural, logical place to go when you think of eBPF, right? Because you can plug to any event and observe what happens with this event. So it's logical to think I get very cheap, very low latency uh, uh, observability directly in the kernel. So what you can do is that you can observe directly with a very low overhead anything that happens. You just plug to the event you're interested in. For example, you can get network performance, SRTT microbursts in terms of performance. You can observe any network card and actually see the bandwidth. You can see all the packets that are being shared uh, that, are, that, that are going through this network interface. Uh, I'll show you some examples with TLS as well. Uh, you can even actually go all the way to HTTP in some cases, at least HTTP uh, 1, HTTP 2 is another story because it's a bit more complex to, uh, to actually parse in eBPF. We can't do it at the moment. It might come in the future as eBPF is getting more complex. Um, you can use it to troubleshoot uh, production on the fly, for example, using BPF trace because you'll be able to see things that happen everywhere in your system and plug to any event you're interested in. So there's lots of software that exists for observability because, again, this is one of the main uh, 
areas where eBPF developed. BCC is one of them. It's a collection of lots of scripts that uses eBPF and allow you to observe a lot of things in your system. BPF trace adds a little bit more uh, abstraction. So you can write little scripts and you can say whenever there's an exec v that uh, event that happens, I want to get the name of the comment and all the arguments or uh, other parameters. So it's very easy to write, very easy to get information directly from anything that happens in your system. And because it's eBPF, you don't need to relaunch the programs to get observability. It starts right away. As soon as there's uh, an event you're looking into that happens after you started observing, you'll see it. So you don't have the problems of, for example, using um, S-Trace in some cases or LD preload where you'd have to maybe reload a program to get observability in some cases. Um, Pixie is, is uh, an observability uh, pro, uh, program as well based on eBPF that is very advanced, as well as Cilium for the network and Cilium Tetragon. So if we look at, it, at BPF trace, for example, you typically have um, a language that you can use in CLI and essentially you write a BPF trace program which will get turned into a BPF program. This BPF program gets injected into the kernel and configured using eBPF maps and the eBPF maps will be used to extradite information from the kernel whenever an event happens. So you can get that information directly. Um, Hubble is an observability uh, system that comes with, with Cilium and it allows you to see network traffic. Now what's really interesting here is the concept of linking the identities, the cloud native identities directly in the kernel. So when you extradite this information, you already have these identities. So here, what you have here looks very much like a TCP dump on steroid for cloud native identities because what you can see here is uh, an X-Wing Kubernetes pod making a request to Disney.com on port 443. And uh, you can see the identities and you can see all the back and forth information uh, uh, and communication. So the X-Wing is making a request to the DNS server in Kubernetes on port uh, 53. And you can see that it's being forwarded to the DNS proxy. Cilium has a DNS proxy that allows to keep the, to store the DNS answer so that it can later on uh, correlate it for network policies, for example, or observability. Then we see the answer from the DNS um, server to the X-Wing uh, pod. And then we see the actual uh, HTTPS communication. So the pod is calling Disney.com on 443. And we see that it's Disney.com because it was recorded by the DNS proxy. So we know the link between the IP that was returned and uh, Disney.com. And then here you see the whole uh, transaction. So sin, sin, ag, ag, fin, RST there was some kind of uh, cut in the communication or maybe um, uh, bad routing at some point, maybe some of this would be missing. You wouldn't get uh, uh, the uh, SYNAC, for example, and then the, the communication would be cut, right? So here you can actually see everything that's happening, the direction, the ports, and so on. You can get some details. This is a, this is a, a summary view. And here at the bottom, we have an example of a network policy that is being denied, and you have the concepts of identities that uh, requested uh, the request, which identity it was destined to, and uh, the fact that it was dropped. In uh, Hubble, we can actually see why it was dropped, so which policy dropped it. And again, all this is computed at the kernel level in eBPF. There's a UI that's very similar, so you can build a service map based on this uh, with the same information. It just presents it differently with uh, the, the link and the communication between the different identities. Obviously, if you can get observability, you can get lots of metrics directly from the kernel. You can plug it to systems like Grafana, for example. I'll show you a few examples of what we can get from Grafana. You can get network metrics. And again, all these network metrics are uh, gotten directly from eBPF, from the communication that happens at the kernel level. So you can get information of which traffic is being exchanged in the kernel. Um, um, all the traffic that is allowed versus dropped, the different flows, uh, the drop reasons, and so on. You can even get uh, HTTP information. In some cases, we can uh, parse HTTP traffic and actually use it to understand why traffic was dropped, what was the, the communication problem between two identities, between two pods, uh, or get uh, statistics uh, of um, how many uh, 500 answers you got, 500 replies you got from uh, a pod to another pod, for example. 
And then we can link it actually to the traces. Some of those traces can come from applications being instrumented using open telemetry, but other traces can also come directly from Hubble, from eBPF, from the kernel, because we're seeing the packets pass, because we can parse the HTTP uh, uh, traffic and extract the trace IDs, which allow us to correlate to the application information and traces. Another possibility is actually recording the, the network policy vertex, uh, again, using eBPF, uh, because we see the traffic and know which traffic has been allowed or has been um, uh, blocked. We can actually trace uh, this. Uh, I'll show an example tomorrow. If, if some of you are coming to the, the workshop tomorrow, uh, there is a lab that actually shows how to use this to monitor how your uh, namespace, Kubernetes namespace, is secured and how to set up a zero trust policy using this. An example of um, node security observability, uh, runtime security, um, using Tetragon would be to observe the, the traffic, the TLS traffic, and actually look at the versions of TLS and the options that are being used. So again, at the kernel level, we can see the TLS traffic. We can look at the different versions that are used. And again, this can be done for any uh, process and any network uh, connections that are done from the nodes. It doesn't have to be Kubernetes or pods that, that do it. It can be on the nodes themselves. And we can see all the traffic that comes from the different processes and actually trace them. The nice thing is we can link it to the metadata. So we can say it's actually this pod in this namespace hosted on this node that made this TLS connection using this version of TLS. So if you want to trace it back to, hey, this version of TLS shouldn't be used you can know exactly which process and which context has actually used it. And finally, we can actually bring all this together. So information coming from Tetragon, typically runtime observability, which are the processes being executed on the machine? What metadata are they associated to? Here we can see that this is uh, what is being executed in the crawler 696 and so on uh, pod and the tenant jobs namespace inside the Minikube's uh, um, cluster. And we see that some of these comments as they're being executed made network connections to other services. Some of them we might not like. There is some kind of reverse shell call that may or may not be an attack, right? It looks like one. You could see this. You could see this happening maybe with Hubble. But then getting back to actually which process in which pod in which namespace actually made that call is a little bit more complicated. So by linking information that we get from, um, from Cilium, from Hubble, on one side with information that we get from observing the processes using BPF, observing the, all the processes that are executed on the machine, we can actually link this and link it to the uh, metadata that are associated with the processes being executed. So that's observability. This is my When it comes to networking, there's a lot of gain as well. So eBPF allows us to bypass native kernel network stacks. You can uh, use XDP, which, which stands for Extra Express Data Path, which allows to bypass some parts of the kernel. You can, like, for example, drop packets entirely. Uh, this is used for DDoS protection. Uh, if you see, I have an example here coming, so I'll wait for the example. Um, you can uh, improve TCP uh, before it actually uh, lands in your kernel. Um, you could add functionalities such as NAT64, NAT46 for IPv6, um, implement performance load balancing algorithms directly in the kernel without the kernel actually natively supporting it. Add support for network policies in the case of Kubernetes, uh, cluster mesh, egress gateway, um, sidecar free service mesh, and so on. I'll just show you a few examples of this. So XDP, Express Data Path, allows to drop or reroute packets before they reach the socket level in the kernel, before they get associated to a socket uh, buffer. So let's take an example of a packet of death. I don't know if some of you remember the packet of death vulnerability from a few years ago. Right? There was this packet, I think it was an ICMP packet, and whenever it reached uh, the, the machine, it would just uh, a crash. So we want to avoid this kind, this kind of behavior. We know what it looks like. 
using an eBPF program, we can actually detect the packet of death before it gets associated to a socket buffer and actually drop it. So we can say with eBPF, this packet doesn't pass, it doesn't reach the kernel, it will not trigger the vulnerability in the kernel. Uh, another thing that can be done that quite a few cloud providers are doing, Facebook is doing with Ktrench, for example, and there's other possibilities. In Cilium, we have a maglev implementation of load balancing that can be used even outside of Kubernetes, is implementing very efficient load balancer um, implementations. There you go, I'm just with it. <laughs> Uh, or, for example, using the socket load balancer, which we have in Cilium. The idea is this. Let's say you have a Kubernetes cluster and you have several pods, several containers on one node. These containers traditionally will talk to each other using the, the TCP IP stack. They will go through IP tables and it will go back and forth between them as if they were on distant machines. This is not very efficient. Using eBPF, what we can do is that we can actually detect that these are actually two processes on the same kernel talking to each other. It's a bit stupid to go through TCP IP every time. So what we can do is actually bypass the TCP IP stack, bypass IP tables, and just say, let's create a socket and make them talk together uh, through a socket directly on the, on the kernel because there are two processes on the same kernel. This is one example. It can go further than this. There's actually some, I'll just mention this, there's actually some uh, network cards that can be programmed using eBPF and XDP. Uh, Melanox is one uh, manufacturer, there's others. So there's, we have customers actually that actually use this to build specific load balancers using eBPF and XDP that are uh, extremely efficient and just bypass the kernel for load balancing. So what they get is pretty much the equivalent of an expensive appliance uh, for load balancing, but implemented using a VM plus eBPF, XDP, and a specific uh, programmable network card. A bit like what we do with GPUs in a way for graphics. Let's uh, talk about IP tables versus eBPF. This is a very important point when it comes to Kubernetes clusters and scaling. When you think of the way IP tables is used for services, and this is just one example, services can be used for other things, for network policies and so on, but let's just look at services and Kubernetes. The way uh, IP tables is used is essentially as a linear list or as a sieve. Uh, so if you have one service in Kubernetes and multiple pods behind that service as backends, then let's say I have three pods, I'll have three rules uh, for the routing and the IP tables rules. All right? And the first rule will say in 33% of, of the cases, route to this pod. The second rule will say in 50% of the cases that are left, route to this one. And the last one will say in 100% of the left cases, go to this last pod. This is not very efficient because you need to go through all the rules to find the one that actually applies to you. And that's not even the main problem. The main problem is that whenever you add a new rule, which happens quite a bit in large Kubernetes clusters, you need to rewrite everything because that's how IP tables work. It's a global system which means that if I have a cluster with a thousand nodes and I have a thousand services and a thousand pods in there, right, just giving examples, that means that every time there's a new pod, you need to rewrite thousands of rules on every node in your cluster. And given the complexity of, of doing this and the complexity of the, the, the IP table system itself, it means that at some point it will start taking a few seconds and a few minutes and a few hours uh, because the complexity is not in O to N, in O of N, it's in O of N to if I'm not wrong, right? So this is not, it doesn't scale well, uh, and all the rules have to be replaced as a whole. On the other side, if you use eBPF-based uh, routing, what you can do is actually use a hash table per CPU that links directly the identities, the cloud-native identity based on labels, to the routing information. So whenever a packet comes, you can actually find directly which route it should take from one identity to the next without going through all the rules. So it's much more efficient. It scales linearly, which means that in theory, you can have an infinity of nodes and it won't be a problem in theory, right? I think we want to, there's people that tested up to like five, seven, six, seven nodes and it was still fine. And the benefit is that you get cloud native routing. So the observability you will get from this as well will take advantage of the metadata that are actually known at the kernel level for the routing. One uh, functionality that was pretty cool that was presented at KubeCon is the uh, integration of BBR, 
So BBR stands for uh, bottleneck bandwidth and round trip propagation time. And this is a replacement for the cubic algorithm for TCP, TCP congestion uh, in Linux, the cubic being the default uh, in Linux systems. And this is the way that uh, TCP connections are managed to uh, reach a proper transmission rate uh, between uh, in a whole network um, stream, right? Um, the, the tests are very interesting. Actually, Google, when they uh, made and communicated on BBR, said that they saw uh, 2,700 times improvement on some of their streams, on some of their throughputs, by implementing this algorithm. The, the example that we had at KubeCon last year actually showed pods that were typically streaming video, and how by the time the video was finished streaming, when you use the cubic algorithm, lots of packets were lost, uh, but we're using BBR, within a few uh, microseconds, the, the, the proper bandwidth was found, and it optimized the, the traffic. So this is, this is very cool, and this is not supported in the Linux kernel, but it can be done at the kernel level using eBPF uh, and Cilium. Another thing that is not supported by the Linux kernel uh, traditionally is NAT4.6, NAT6.4, uh, so transitions between IPv4 and IPv6 networks. What if I have a Kubernetes cluster that is running on IPv6, but running inside a network on IPv4? How do I do the transition? Well, with Selenium, we've implemented this using a BPF, so the routing still goes natively through the Linux kernel, and the Linux kernel can do the transition. There's two options, either in a stateful way or in a stateless way, depending on how you want to manage the correlation of addresses between uh, the IPv4 and the IPv6 world. So again, features that do not exist yet in the Linux kernel um, and that would require appliances otherwise to get this level of performance can actually be implemented in the Linux kernel using eBPF by plugging to events and devices in, in the kernel. Um, one last one for this, uh, for this part, for this um, kind of low network stack is big TCP, the possibility of having uh, jumbo, um, jumbo gram extension headers in uh, IPv6 traffic to get bigger packets, which allows for much lower latency and much higher bandwidth. Maybe most of us are not really concerned. We're not having this limit of like 200 gigabytes per second uh, on, on our traffic, but uh, we have some customers that want really high throughput um, uh, data using IPv6, and they're limited by what the Linux kernel can do natively, and this removes this limit by actually implementing big TCP, which I think is now standard in the 519 kernel, but otherwise uh, did not exist before that, so we can actually implement this in much older kernels using eBPF. One thing that is more useful for a lot of us is this idea of doing service mesh with that sidecar. So traditionally, a lot of the service mesh implementations to this day is done by injecting sidecars, by injecting typically Envoy proxies in every pod uh, on your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, the idea here is that we have one Envoy proxy per node, and we're using eBPF to route through this proxy dynamically and configure the proxy dynamically. What we get from this, again, is a drastic simplification of the network stack because we can directly bypass all the, the TCP IP uh, communication between the, the pods and the proxies, and again, the proxy to the other uh, next proxy into the pod and so on. So if you have a lot of communication between pods and you add proxies to each of them, it can quickly become very complex, and this can be simplified here. Last but not least, security. <laughs> Security is also a very natural place for eBPF to be implemented. Why? Because, well, you get the observability of everything that happens in your OS. I wouldn't say for free, but for very cheap. And there are things that we want to do in terms of security, like blocking processes, that can be done much better using eBPF. So the traditional approaches, when you want to observe processes being executed and decide if you want to allow them or not to continue. There's different approaches. One is using uh, LD preload or ap uh, application instrumentation, right? So application instrumentation, you need to actually modify your application code so you know that you're securing this application to be uh, observed and potentially blocked. LD preload is similar, except you will replace the standard library with an implementation that allows you to catch uh, 
the syscalls. Again, that means you know in advance which processes you want to observe. It's pretty hard to do this on everything. Uh, you've got the ptrace, <coughs> sorry, a ptrace approach, which is great as well. There's a problem with the ptrace approach, which is the talk to, which is that um, when uh, a function is calling from user space is calling the kernel, is making a syscall, it prepares the parameters to be passed to the kernel. This is what you usually detect that is going to happen. This is what you might want to block. But actually, at the moment when it calls, it can change the parameters at the last moment. And you might not be able to detect this. So this is one, one problem with this approach. Um, there's existing kernel runtime enforcement, essentially based on modules such as LSM, the Linux security module. Uh, and LSM actually got some eBPF uh, improvements in kernel 5.7. This is great, but not everyone has a kernel 5.7. So one possibility also is to have your own kernel module, but there's problems in terms of stability and maintenance. Obviously, you need to convince people to use your kernel module, and a kernel module means that you might crash your machine or introduce new security issues in the system. So what we can do instead is we can typically use eBPF to monitor the different uh, the different syscalls, the different events in the kernel. Again, that can be syscalls, that can be file access, that can be uh, uh, namescape escapes, that can be privilege escalation, links to C groups, for example, as well. It can be data access, it can be networking. And based on this, we can observe everything and we can actually uh, decide to block the processes even. So here, what we can do is with eBPF, we can actually uh, have a callback that will detect um, either an exec VE or a change in namespace or whatever, and then decide to kill the process. And this kill will actually be a real-time kill in that it will not happen after the process has time to do something else uh, because it will be able to kill the process before the, the, the event that has been captured can be scheduled in a kernel. So there's several tools that actually use this, right? Tetragon is just one of them. So this, uh, this was just a, a little bit of a tour of what can be done with eBPF and what, why it's interesting in a lot of different um, cases and areas. So if we look to the future, things that are coming is improved device uh, IO perf, for example, using uh, XRP. That's the, what, what I mentioned, this idea of using eBPF to improve database performance, for example. Uh, support for 100% of C at the moment. Uh, eBPF is based on a subset of C. Actually, some people use SDKs as well to code in eBPF. There are some abstractions that will generate the, the C code for you and then the bytecode for you. Uh, for people that do advanced stuff with eBPF, usually they code in C, but the whole of C is not supported for security and complexity reasons. So they're aiming to add more and more of it. So with new versions of the kernel, you get new functionalities in eBPF, like more support for C, more helpers, more events you can attach to. And for this reason, some programs will say, you know, we use eBPF. It doesn't matter which distribution of Linux you use, which libraries you use. What matters is the version of the kernel because we're using this eBPF functionality that exists since kernel 5.9 or something like that. Um, Cross-platform um, architectures, compilers, making it portable. Platforms, yes, platforms. eBPF is fundamentally a Linux technology. But Microsoft has announced in March last year that they were porting it to Windows. They've actually made a demo of it. Uh, they showed that they could start a Cilium agent on Windows. And this is very exciting for us <laughs> to know that actually even people that might want to run Windows node on Kubernetes, for example, might be able to use eBPF for this. So if Microsoft is willing to bet on the eBPF technology for the Windows kernel, well, that's getting interesting. Not that I want to use it, but <laughs> it means something. Um, and eventually, maybe even going towards a microkernel approach, right? It's always been a problem and um, a, a critique, right, of the Linux kernel that it was monolithic from the start. Um, eBPF might actually help us to go towards, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, right? But towards a microkernel approach where the kernel would essentially be a scheduling uh, system with drivers and events and most of the functionalities around it could evolve much faster than the current lifecycle for Linux because you could inject them using eBPF. 
So at the moment, all major cloud providers actually have picked an eBPF-based networking and security for the Kubernetes platforms, at least one. Uh, it's true AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud are uh, providing Cilium as an option uh, for the routing and security. So where do you learn more about eBPF resources? Uh, we have a podcast every week that is called Echo. You can find all the episodes on YouTube. There's like 70 episodes at this point. And every time, it lasts about an hour, and it goes through uh, all the new things happening in the eBPF uh, um, environment, in the eBPF world, and specific features that are coming, and then there's uh, an exploration of a specific feature. Uh, there's an Echo News uh, newsletter, bi-weekly newsletter, um, that goes with it, pretty much. And there's a, a Slack server for eBPF and uh, Cilium as well. Last but not least, if you're interested, I'm still here tomorrow morning, and I will have a practical lab, a workshop, with uh, labs on Cilium, Hubble, Tetragon, and eBPF. It lasts four hours. I have like 16 labs that I can propose to you. Uh, plus, if you want, I can answer your questions. So if you're interested, you can come tomorrow in room B2015 from 9 to 13. Just bring your laptop. It's web-based uh, labs. So you just need an internet connection and a web browser, and that's pretty much it. And you can get badges, and I'll bring t-shirts. I have lots of t-shirts, so I hope I have enough people to distribute my t-shirts to. And for now, I only have stickers if you want stickers. So thank you. And yep, if you have questions, I'm open for questions. Yes. Uh, how are eBPF programs validated, actually? How are eBPF programs validated, actually? I don't know the details myself. <laughs> this is a good question to ask on the Slack channel, probably. Um, I know that it actually analyzes the program and looks for all the different possible paths that it will take. Uh, for example, you cannot have an infinite loop in any in an eBPF program. You can have a loop if you can prove how many times the loop would happen. Uh, so if you know in advance how many times it will loop, then you can do this. There's actually ways to bypass this in some ways because you can actually attach eBPF. You ha can have tail calls, so eBPF programs can actually call other eBPF programs. That's a form of events that is possible. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the details of how it's validated. So there's, yeah, how are eBPF maps uh, secured in the kernel and programs as well? Uh, there's, a, there's actually capabilities in the Linux kernel that you can activate uh, in order to allow accessing uh, eBPF subsystems. Um, typically what we do in Cilium in order to avoid conflicts is that whenever Cilium is deployed on a node, we deactivate access to uh, BPF for other programs. We can make exceptions. There's people that want Cilium plus a load balancer of their own. But uh, yeah, you, you need a specific capability to access it in the kernel. This has actually been refined, I think, in li uh, recent versions of Linux 5. Yes? Would it be desirable to, uh, in the long term, see certain um, functions or implementation that are not solved by essentially injecting code to the BBF in the kernel to have this as part of the kernel in the long term, or will it just stay like uh, a modular? Yeah, that's almost a, ph a philosophical question, right? Would it be good to actually get things that are implemented in eBPF at the moment and get them merged in the kernel uh, statically? That's your question, right? Um, well, th there's some things that are happening. For example, I showed uh, the big TCP support actually landed in Linux 5.19. I think at some point there's some features that make sense to have by default. Uh, the nice thing about eBPF is that you can keep having a fast uh, development cycle uh, to get these features to evolve much faster than they would evolve in uh, Linux versions. So you can, if the BBPF uh, subsystems are available to implement it, you can actually backport a lot of features to older versions of the kernel uh, in a much easier way. So yeah, and I think it makes sense. Eventually, things like uh, a lot of the service mesh, a lot of like HTTP observability, uh, for example, 
our vision is that it should end up in the kernel in the same way that, it, that TCP IP ended up in the kernel some uh, decades ago. And before that, you needed to instrument your application manually. Uh, eventually, it should get there. But in the meanwhile, it makes sense to use eBPF for this. How much of it would end up in the kernel? I don't know. <laughs> And it's true that one downside, if I have to give a downside of eBPF at the moment, is that the more applications use eBPF for observability, security, networking, and so on, the more likely we are to actually have conflicts between the different applications. So you might not want to actually deploy three, four, five applications on your node that all use eBPF, because they might be linking to the same callbacks. Who will observe the observer? Yeah, also. <laughs> There's, uh, there's, there's some good talks coming on this to KubeCon, actually, from some of my colleagues from the security side on observing the, the eBPF uh, programs and, uh, and understanding where they come from, and what they do, and what privileges they have. Yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Well, thank you. And I have uh, stickers here if you want. <laughs>